This video is sponsored by my Patreon patrons, the ranks of which you should join because it'll make you bloody cool. Get it? I, the joke is I bloody because of blood, because this is a video about vampires and they drink blood. It's funny, isn't it? You can find all that stuff in the video description. Vampire the Masquerade by default presents you with 13 clans to play with as basic character options. These 13 clans represent 13 different types of vampire from like the various agglomerations of tropes around vampires that exist and they give you a rough outline that you may or may not wish to follow as to what your character might be like. I made a video outlining all of those in detail so if you have no idea what I'm talking about you might want to go check that out but I assume most of you already have a decent understanding of of the 13 clans, so we're going to get right into it and dig a layer deeper into what was once upon a time called Bloodlines. I say once upon a time, I mean in V20, back when they mattered in like any way, shape or form. As of Vampire 5th edition, they kind of don't exist anymore, but I mean also, especially in the lore, they still totally do. It's complicated, so we'll need to first even understand what a Bloodline is. Vampire clans as unified as some of them might pretend to be are in fact these huge, diverse, complicated endeavors full of different factions and sects and interest groups and people who just are laws unto themselves. In a more mechanical sense, the things that really define them is the in-clan disciplines that they have in common and the bane that they all have in common. Except in all the cases where they don't. The blood of Cain is mutable. Every single kindred has their own little fluctuations, their own little quirks that apply only to them or a very, very small group of people like them. No single vampire is the average vampire. And every kindred has, in theory, the ability to learn any other discipline from any other clan. It's just that the price for that is a little steeper. It's like how we have the code to create tentacles in our DNA, even though we don't have tentacles. Anywhere, that's kind of how the magic of Cain's gift works. It's passed through the generations. Maybe one day we will have tentacles, I mean. I also do sci-fi content. A bloodline is generally an offshoot off of a main clan that either has a different loadout of inherent disciplines, a fundamental philosophical difference with the main clan, or a fundamentally different way of using those core disciplines, which usually is represented by a different philosophical outlook on the world. Some of them even have a different clan bane. However, these things are not true about all blood lines. Something I love about World of Darkness, and Vampire the Masquerade in particular, is that it's full of uh, contradictions, differences of opinion, and little idiosyncrasies that make no sense. In universe, there's a lot of disagreement on what actually constitutes a bloodline. The word bloodline is like the words fish or vegetable. It has no inherent scientific meaning, but when I say it, you kind of have a general idea of what I'm talking about, and it's probably going to be pretty accurate. But when it comes to the finer details, there's going to be a lot of disagreement. For instance, a lot of kindred will agree that the anti-tribu of a given clan are a bloodline of that clan. An errant bloodline, to be specific. Anti-tribu are kindred that have split off and gone the opposite way from the main political sector usually position of their main clan, like for instance when someone from a Camarilla clan is in the Sabat or vice versa. A Toreador that is in the Sabat instead of the Camarilla is a Toreador Antitribu. But there's disagreements on who even is really the Antitribu in some clans. Leadership and a significant number of Clan La Sombra recently joined the Camarilla. So does that mean that the majority of the La Sombra who is still with the Sabat are now La Sombra Antitribu, or are now the leadership, the Antitribu, that joined the Camarilla. Because for centuries, Camarilla La Sombra were La Sombra Antitribu. What about the Gangrel? They left the Camarilla, but they didn't join the Sabat. They're just more 
gangrels, independent, disorganized, not centralized. Can you even claim that there is such a thing as an as a gangrel anti-tribu? Is that really a, a concept that you could justify? Or do you say because they're mainly aligned with the Anarch movement now in like a informal type way that both the gangrel in the Sabat and the gangrel in the Camarilla are anti-tribu? The answer to all these questions is going to highly depend on whom you ask. And because these things, especially in universe, are completely just social constructs, there's no objectively correct answer. Now you could look at the rule books and see which of the clans is defined as anti-tribu, although even there it's not always so very clear, but I feel like that would be cheating. To make matters worse, there are anti-tribu groups who are defined by having different disciplines from the main clan, while most anti-tribus don't. So if you use the disciplines have to be different for the measuring stick as to what constitutes bloodline, some some anti-tribu are bloodlines, and others are not. And now, additionally, not only do bloodlines often have different loadouts of disciplines, many of them even have unique disciplines that only they have access to, that are sort of their defining characteristic. And this is where we get to the point where Vampire 5 just sort of went, nah to the disciplines of these bloodlines, and thus the thing that mechanically gives them a lot of identity. Like, those disciplines make up a huge chunk of what that bloodline is about. And the problem is, Vampire 5 has yeeted these kinds of identity-giving disciplines even from mainline clans. You know how with the Ministry they went Serpentis ES now protean batsnake. I mean, they got rid of vicissitude, for fuck's sake. They didn't need to do that. That wasn't a necessary thing that needed to happen. The they're all in the- you can just look at the old editions and take the words and put them into the new ones. You own the copyright to this. I mean, they still exist, vicissitude is still a thing, but now it's like a power shoehorned into a combination of other disciplines, basically reducing this- and I cannot stress this enough, identity giving signature power to a footnote. In practical terms, though, you can basically play as a bloodline vampire with a little bit of GM fiat, a little bit of homebrewing in V5, just like you can essentially bring back the old disciplines. Not too complicatedly. I mean, straight up, it just, it is just in the text of the old, it's the, di you can go to the wiki, it's on a wiki. I don't understand why they did this. And hey, if you are some sort of heretic that deserves to be burned at the stake, you can definitely also emulate those bloodlines abilities by like making one of the combination signature and what amalgam powers. That's some um, you really want to do. If that's a line you want to cross, a moral event horizon that you want to Get yourself right past. Just, you know, go to confession about it, maybe. Anyway, there's really no limit to the amount of bloodlines that exist. I mean, there is in the sense that there is, exists only a limited amount of bloodlines, but they're, they're not capped at 13 the way clans are, and not all of them have been described yet, so there's a lot of room for interpretation. And I will be telling you about some of the coolest among them now. Just quick side note, I'm not going to be talking about the Libon in this video, uh, because they're kind of not really a bloodline, and that's going to be a video all on its own. Just the whole political ecosystem of Africa, where you have Nosferatu kings and sneaky Torridor. It is incredible. I mean, that's completely fascinating. Not, it's too big for this one. Clan Markavian already has a bit of a bit of a reputation to deal with when it comes to uh, being crazy, which is entirely true and makes them dangerous not even by virtue of them being crazy, but by virtue of them being fucking vampires. There's a huge societal bias because of course those individuals stand out more and so your availability heuristic is gonna go, oh, they make up a larger percentage of the, this group of people than they actually do with the mentally ill for them being like dangerous people and they do at least when they're having an episode tend to be rather unpredictable but that's not really an accurate representation of reality it actually makes you a lot more likely to become the victim 
of violent crime than it does make you more prone to violent crime. I say this because with the Ananke, that is very specifically not what we are talking about. This is a bloodline of killers, and killers of the most gruesome variety they are. They were, in the olden days, originally a sort of priestly caste to help the main body of the clan seek meaning between the folds of the symbology of reality. To achieve this, they practiced haruspexy, which is the ritual slaughter and evisceration of animals in order to find hidden omens and obscure truths. Haruspexy, not a vampire the masquerade term, by the way, it's a real historical phenomenon that really, if you want to be strict about it, uh, clearly is about like reading the divination patterns in eviscerated animals, but these days it's also used to mean like tea leaf reading or like handline reading anything where you have a certain pattern and you interpret information from that but to be historically accurate it's only specifically entrails as probably most of you have already surmised the Ananke don't do haruspexy with dead animals but with dead people except usually the people are alive at the beginning of the haruspexy process and sort of stop doing that. They're serial killers, much more so than Kindred usually are, and they are also often embraced from the ranks of serial killers. And it's not just the regular type of serial killer, it's the kind of serial killer that does these artistic displays with their victims that only they really understand. The Ananke have a slightly different discipline spread than the rest of their clan, with all specs being the ability to have like heightened sharpened senses, but in this case specifically, probably more an ability to perceive the supernatural patterns in the Haruspexy that they do. Dementation, which is the ability to instill madness, although now in 5th edition it is obviously dominate. And the thing where they differ is they have presence, which is supernatural charisma instead of obfuscate. They also have a variant of the clan bane where their derangement specifically pertains to having to sort of take trophies from all of their kills and then sit on them in ritual meditation to contemplate the secrets of the universe that are behind this severed hand. Their origin is shrouded in mystery, though many think that the founder of this bloodline is the Anku, which is one of the scariest motherfuckers in the whole of vampire lore, and most people outside of Clan Malkavian do not think that it exists. It essentially has the ability to sort of teleport through the Malkavian madness network and invade the dreams of Malkavians, like some Freddy Krueger type shit, except when you wake up, it's still there in the real world now. The Anku is never seen, uh, at least not by anyone that is still unalive in any meaningful way, but it is detected by the holes it rips into the fabric of the Madness Network. When you become Malkavian, without needing to be told about the Anku, you are automatically instilled with an instinctive fear of it. So whenever another Malkavian suddenly disappears and it was the Anku, a screech of horror that is like half desperation, half warning, goes through the network and Malkavians everywhere go into hiding. It's kind of like how when an orca kills a great white shark and all the great white sharks in the area just fuck off. This really explains why the Ananke are feared and respected by the elders of the clan, as they are one of its most ancient manifestations. One of the most fucked up bloodlines in terms of the sheer inhumanity of them are the Blood Brothers, who were created as a sort of collaboration between Tremere and Sumitsi spellcasters in the Sabbat, and as such, they don't really have a parent clan. Basically what'll happen is these Sabbat sorcerers will sort of get together, a, usually a group of people that is already somehow bonded and or used to violence. Like for instance, perfect candidates, a, a squad that was in war together, or a gang, or a family, they need to have some sort of basis to make the process easier. And then, during the process of turning them into kindred, they transform them into a single mind. Through this process, all members of that group of blood brothers lose their entire sense of individuality, like completely. And though this isn't a natural part of the transformation process, it is standard practice to use vicissitude to like shape all of them to look the same. Blood Brothers need to be with each other at 
all times and they become extremely irritated at the very idea that there might be some sort of difference between them in any way shape or form. They are utterly loyal to each other, they care only about each other which of course in terms of their personal experience means themselves and though the Sabbat has instilled them with unquestioning fanatical devotion to their creators They've also been sure enough to, like, prevent them from being able to sire any child of their own. Their discipline spread is fortitude, which is supernatural toughness, potence, which is supernatural strength, the combination of which already makes them into incredibly powerful fighters that few clans can match by default, and Sanguinus, which is their signature discipline. And let's fucking talk about Sanguinus here for a moment, because it is fucked up. Basically, Sanguinus Sanguinus is a derivative of the flesh crafting discipline of vicissitude and it allows the blood brothers to perceive the world as one, to have a shared mind. They literally fight as one. You know, like sensei, but they're like actually all the same person. And I hear you asking, oh, being mentally linked up, that sounds more like a Malkavian thing than a vicissitude thing. What is so vicissitude about this discipline? Well, I am horrified that you ask, because basically what Sanguinos allows the Blood Brothers to do is instantly send each other body parts of themselves and like access to bodily functions that they have. This means that in a mentally linked combat scenario, when one of the blood brothers happens to currently be in the back line and another blood brother who is at the front happens to be in need of an extra pair of arms, the blood brother in the back line will retract his arms and they will emerge from the body of the other blood brother. And they can do this with base attributes. Four of them become like mega scrawny and one of them becomes like this huge hulking motherfucker with the strength and muscle mass of five skinheads. Experienced blood brother groups can like meld into a singular flesh entity. Even powerful elder vampires are going to take the L and fuck off when they see that coming. See, this is why it's good that the Tremere and the Tsumitsi are mortal enemies, because when they put their differences aside for their shared interests, shit like this happens. The Daughters of Cacophony, or the Sons of Discord, for the few male ones who I assume just sort of hang out on the internet all day is yet another bloodline without a clear singular clan ancestor, though it, people are pretty sure that they're like a collaboration between Toreador and Malkavians. They're relatively recent, only emerging in like the Victorian era, though their own creation myth points to a Toreador elder being instructed in the art of singing by a powerful fey creature. Association with them, especially by having one of them in your service, is especially among Toreador a mark of great prestige because they are the most powerful singers. They have access to the in-clan discipline's fortitude, which is supernatural toughness, melpomine, which as you might have surmised is supernatural magical singing, and presence, which is the supernatural charisma of vampires. Their signature power is, of course, melpomine, which allows them to tap into their constant inner music, also known as the fugue, and instill all manner of powerful emotions, visions, and delusions in the people who are listening. It's an incredibly useful tool of manipulation, especially if you want to get around to manipulating Elder Toreador, because they still want to like feel emotions, and this kind of thing is the only way they can still do that. Living doesn't do it for them anymore, so many of the Daughters of Cacophony become secret power brokers among the Toreador ranks. It can also be used for stuff like discreetly sending messages to people, like the sending spell in D&D. Daughters of Cacophony make music of all styles you can conceive of and it is not explicitly written down but heavily implied that they can use the effects of Melpomene not just by singing but also by playing instruments. Among the Daughters of Cacophony there are those who completely succumb to their inner song, their fugue, and those the sirens call banshees. They're a special type of white that, instead of having lost its sense of humanity, has lost its sense of reality and thus becomes extremely dangerous and unpredictable, which is where the Malkavian element of the whole thing comes in. If you know anything about Clan Tremere is that they have a lot of enemies and nobody really likes them, 
but also that of all the clans that don't like them very much, the Tsumitsi have a special hatred of them. And the reason for this is the gargoyles. Basically, what happened is that around the 12th century or so, the Tremere decided that they needed more obedient slaves, but they couldn't be Tremere because Let's be honest here for a second, not even the Tremere like Tremere all that much. So Verstania, a sorceress who had always had a penchant for sort of making her own companions, developed a technique of taking apart two kindred and recombining them into one that would expand the Tremere toolbox. To this end, Nosferatu, Gangrel, and Samitsi kindred were captured, destroyed, and put back together. And all of them were chosen because they had a certain, you know, mutability and ability to change, but the former two were, were chosen also because they're like lesser clans. The Tremere consider them just basically animals. But the Tsumitsi were also chosen because it was convenient. The Tremere headquarters was at the time located in Transylvania. This is how the first gargoyles were created, and a lot of kindred died in this process. And while the Nosferatu are too pragmatic to hold grudges, and the Gangrel don't really care all that much that the weakest among their ranks were called, the Tsumitsi hate the Tremere for this to this day. The first gargoyles came in three variants, that being Scout, Sentinel, and Warrior. Scouts were amalgams of Gangrel and Nosferatu, and they had access to the discipline's all specs, so they could see good, Flight, which is sort of self-explanatory, and Proteans, so they could change their shape as needed. Sentinels were amalgams of Nosferatu and Sumitsi, and they had access to the discipline's Flight, Fortitude, so they could take a hit defending their master's holdings, and Potence, so they could give a hit defending their master's holdings. And finally, the Warriors were amalgams of Gangrel and Sumitsi, and they had the discipline's Flight, Fortitude, so they could get the shit beaten out of them, and Protean, so they would have the ability to adapt to various different combat situations. These original gargoyles were not able to embrace and have childer of their own, though through reasons that are not entirely clear, this changed over time, and by the time of the Anarch Revolt in the 15th century, they could do that, and they did do that. And tired of centuries of demeaning servitude, they, led actually by their original creator Verstania, rebelled against the Tremere, and many of them escaped. This actually forced the Tremere to move their head chantry to Vienna, and it also made them implement a special program where they now ruthlessly hunt down every single gargoyle not controlled by a Tremere and just destroy them. They do not get a second chance. This is actually why the UK, and London specifically, has for a while been a safe haven for gargoyles because Mithras, the Ventru king of Albion, woke up from Torpor one day, found out that there was such a thing as the Tremere now, and went, They diabolized who? Saulat. Oh shucks, I really like that guy. That's really not a cool cat thing to do. Hmm. Well, I guess all of you Tremere fellas are now banned from my domain. I don't want to see none of you being around here. Now that Mithras is probably dead, which, you know, you never know with these Methuselah whether or not that is really the case, uh, the Tremere are once again openly operating in London, and it's becoming kind of a problem for those gargoyles that did survive the purge of the Second Inquisition that also happened there. Luckily, the gargoyles of the modern knights have access to a different spread of disciplines, namely fortitude, supernatural toughness, Potence, Supernatural Strength, and Visceratica, which I will get to in a minute. But crucially, they still have access to the Flight Discipline. It's just not tech- it's mechanically a discipline, but it's not like a discipline discipline, making them sort of the only vampires capable of flight in their natural form. Visceratica allows gargoyles access to the powers of stone and also buildings and architecture. This can materialize in simple things, like they can harden their skin even more than it already is through their fortitude rating, but also they can like sense everyone in the building and where exactly they are. They can meld into the walls and into rock, and at high levels, if they are entirely motionless, they can just be 
be outside the whole day in the sunlight. This also all really helps with like not breaching the masquerade all that much because they are very clearly not human. Earlier we talked about a bloodline that was of the opinion that it came to be through fairy interference and while that may sound like mumbo jumbo to some, that is exactly how the Kyacid bloodline of the La Sombra became the giant reclusive scholars of the occult that they are today. Historically, Kyacid referred to any kind of vampire that was somehow touched by fairy blood, which were generally, as a rule of thumb, hunted by other vampires because fairy interference can do all kinds of weird shit. However, in the 4th century, the mage turned La Sombra scholar Marconius after a particularly deep and eventful delve through the veil with the powers of obtenebration, came back changed. He was now suddenly over two meters tall with pale skin that glowed ever so faintly and black eyes with neither irises nor pupils. His existence was considered a threat at the time by La Sombra leadership and only the interference of a powerful Methuselah ensured that he was, instead of just being destroyed, imprisoned in the dungeon of the castle that was the La Sombra headquarters near Syracuse. Syracuse in Sicily, by the way, not Syracuse in New York. It's a different, much older place. He was freed during the Anarch Revolt, meaning that he was imprisoned for like a thousand years. But he bounced back, you know, not without severe scars. He did bounce back, became the Prince of Strasbourg even. He officially founded the Chiasid bloodline and then went on to exterminate all of the kindred that were Chiasids but not of his own brood, which led to those that survived that very sudden, very strong onslaught renaming themselves into the Magar. The Arsets have access to the discipline's dominate, which is mind control, though some of them have necromancy instead, Mithakeria, which is their signature discipline, and Obtenebration, which is the Lysombra signature discipline of having power over shadows. Mithakeria is a very subtle power that has changed a lot over the additions, but fundamentally it allows the Chiasids to have an intuitive understanding of magic and fairy glamours, and is a bit of a toolbox to, through powers of trickery, fuck with people's perception of the world, but in a more actual and real way than chemistry. This is of course the perfect power for these very reclusive kindred who like to spend most of their time in havens that are basically just gigantic libraries disconnected from the rest of the world and even their own kind. A lot of the time you're gonna be lucky if even the prince knows that there is a Chiasid anywhere in their domain, and usually it's gonna be only one. Not all Bloodline have their own individual disciplines. Some of them don't even have any kind of blood relation to each other at all, but spring from philosophical differences. Like, for instance, the Mariner Bloodline of Clan Gangrel. Just because your sire was of the Mariner Bloodline doesn't mean you have to be. And just because your sire was not of the Mariner bloodline doesn't mean you can't become a Mariner. It's a lifestyle choice. Now, vampires are very much creatures of the city. It's their natural habitat. It's where the prey lives. Not to mention there's like werewolves and all other kind of crazy shit out in the country. But then there has always been the gangrel who much prefer being kindred out in the wilderness. They don't really fear all the terrible things that dwell there. Of course there's still a lot of gangrel living in the cities but even they tend to stick to the wilder parts of town. But for all those who live outside of the walls of urbanism, there's actually a lot of options in the natural world as to how and where you'd like to live. It doesn't need to be the forest or the mountains. It could also be underwater. Vampires don't need to breathe. The main limiting factor is really that there's not that many humans underwater. But nonetheless, this is where Mariner Gangrel make their home. You can find them anywhere from coral reef to flooded caves to even the open ocean. Gangrel are much better at gaining sustenance from wild animals than most of the other clans in the first place, and water is actually very effective at blocking out sunlight. Not to mention, if you catch on fire, you are already underwater. Just like regular Gangrel, Mariner Gangrel have accessed the discipline's animalism, which is controlled over animals, 
fortitude, which allows them to survive in the high pressure environments of the ocean, and protein, which is shape-shifting. And that really is where the main difference lies between the two variants of the clan, where the regular gangrel use protein to get like night vision eyes and transform into owls and wolves. Mariner gangrel prefer to get like sonar and transform into orcas and sharks. Because of their inherent disconnection with humanity, many of them actually turn into whites rather quickly though they're not really identified as such because they're like some let's like, sea monster that is somewhere in some like fucking deep lake and even the ones who aren't white specifically will behave that way a lot of the time a lot of the scary shit underwater is misidentified mariner gangrel the tremere are not the only mages to eventually become vampires the nagaraja also count among this number though the path they took was different and in my original clans video i actually suggested that the nagaraja somehow had uh, cappadocius as their antediluvian which is not true. During the entire process of sort of writing that video, recording it, editing it, it never occurred to me that it could possibly be interpreted that way. But I... It kinda is the only reasonable interpretation of what I said. Like, you can't see that and not think that what I said is that the Nagaraja are childer of Cappadocius, which it just isn't the case. The first Nagaraja were created as warriors by a group of mages from northern India when they entered a pact with a mummy, which do exist in World of Darkness and they are extremely rare and very, very powerful. Basically, the pact was that they would help the mummy protect the lost city of Enoch, which is where the Cain originally lived and the Antediluvians all come from, and which was at the time located in the Shadowlands, which is sort of like the upside down of the World of Darkness universe. And in exchange for their help, the mummy would give them a spell that would make them immortal. And you know how when sometimes you're in a conversation with very smart people, but you don't want to seem stupid, and they're like talking to you about something, and you do your best to bullshit, to like pretend that you know what they're talking about. That's kind of what the these mages did with the spell that was given to them for immortality. They did gain immortality and became immensely powerful. They formed an organization called the Tal Me Ra, which is a, a very influential in the vampire world to this day. But they really had to kind of figure it out on their own with the spell that they didn't quite get the hang of as like a guideline. The purpose of the Tal Me Ra, by the way, is to watch over and sort of listen to the four crypts that are buried deep underneath the first city in the Shadowlands, which, like, straight up no one knows what is in those scripts, or if even there's, like, four beings in those scripts, there's a lot of theories around what, what might be in them, because clearly power radiates from them, and they sap energy from mages and kindred and whatever the fuck alike, but no one actually knows what is in there. But they soon found out that it was actually a lot of work protecting Enoch from, like, incursions and whatever the fuck other stuff. Like, for instance, the followers of Set, and that was why the mummy wanted their help in the first place. And so, in order to cope with fighting against the Setites, they took some volunteers among their ranks and infused this magic spell that they had with Setite vampire blood to turn them into kindred. This way, the first Nagaraja happened and they could enter kindred society and strengthen the Talmera, which at this point is comprised not of mages, but mostly of vampires. And the result of all this was a unique type of vampire that instead of just drinking blood, had to consume the flesh of its victims. They have access to the discipline's auspects, which is heightened senses, dominate, which is mind control, and nihilistics, also known as the vitreous path of necromancy, which is a specific version of the necromancy discipline that focuses on various kinds of interactions with the Veil vale and the Shadowlands. When some of the surviving Nagaraja joined Clan Hikata fairly recently, uh, this in Vampire 5, I mean, was uh, changed into Oblivion, which I guess is kind of like mostly what the power of Oblivion is about, at least, I guess. And they can, you know, also get Dominate as a discipline instead of Fortitude as a Hikata clan. Oh, and the reason I say surviving Nagaraja is because a lot of them were destroyed because there was like a magic hurricane in the Shadowlands in 1999, and it sort of destroyed Enoch. And what 
really, it really kind of pisses me off about all this is that by joining the Hikata, they lost their inherent clan bane of like having serrated teeth and having to consume their victims whole. Which yes, I will grant you any day of the week that that is an extremely big bane. It makes them very powerless, they have no access to like, obfuscate type powers, even smiling at another person is immediately a masquerade breach, and it's a lot more work to sort of completely eat a person instead of just taking some blood from them. And you always kill your victim in the process of doing that, so they can't, like, subtly cleave some blood off their relatives like many vampires can do. But it's so cool and interesting. It just, it is so cool. Even in the World of Darkness universe, a lot of people think that vampires are sort of repelled by the sight of the cross, which couldn't be further from the truth. A lot of vampires are actually devout Christians, and the Archangel Michael was actually a Toreador Methuselah who created his own bloodline. He isn't the actual Archangel Michael, according to some versions and interpretations of the law, he just thinks he is, but according to others, he is the guy, it's complicated. So you know how the Toreador are obsessed with art and beauty? The Nephilim are this, like, times a million. Michael was one of the architects of the Dream, a sort of vampire utopia where kindred could live in harmony with each other and rule over the kind while in dedication and supplication to the Great Divine. The Dream existed for a thousand years in the city of Constantinople, but eventually fell apart when two of its leaders, including Michael, met the final death, and especially among older vampires, the fall of Constantinople is still a bit of a hot button issue. What remains is the Nephilim Basilica, a cult that worships the blood of Michael across various different clans and sects, actually. They live strict, dedicated lives of art and also debauchery because they're fucking Toreador. And they're waiting for the return of someone with Michael's blood, or perhaps even the return of the Archangel himself. They have access to the disciplines Auspex, which is supernatural senses, Chemistry, which is uh, illusion magic and actually the signature discipline of Clan Ravnos, and Presence, which is supernatural charisma. However, it's not that simple because the Nephilim are not quite like other the bloodlines. So the founder of the cult and the founder of the bloodline was a Toreador, and most of the leadership of that cult is still Toreador. However, people from any clan, can, even mortals to a certain extent, can join the cult and they do benefit from access to the Vitae of Michael. Like it fundamentally changes them as vampires. Most notably, this is like an angelic beautification type process where you get like very symmetrical, hard lined angelic features in this like marbly skin. The very way you carry yourself becomes divine. You cease to be undead and start being statuesque. Kind of, and I hate to say this, like vampires in Twilight. Except, of course, they don't have access to celerity, so they don't have super speed, which the Toreador usually do. They don't have access to potence, uh, which none of the Toreador do, uh, or fortitude, so it's also, you can, they're not supernaturally tough. But, and also they don't really sparkle, but kind of like the vampires in Twilight. This is even true for the Nosferatu who can also join the cult and can also benefit from the Vitae of Michael. Although, because of just how disgusting they already are, they can never attain beauty. The most original, like the ones that were mutated the least <clears throat> and are the most human passing among the Nosferatu can end up looking pretty human through this Vitae. But of course, and this is very important, Drinking the vitae of a vampire blood binds you to them. So you get blood bound to the leadership and the direct descendants of Michael. Speaking of the Nosferatu, if the Anku that I mentioned earlier wasn't enough of a horror story for you, let me introduce the Niktuku. Very classic example of why 
uh, bloodline is kind of really in the eye of the beholder because the Nictuku are arguably closer to the Nosferatu antediluvian than the rest of the clan. They are also the real reason why the Nosferatu hide underground. So in my original clans video, I already alluded to the fact that Absimiliad, the Nosferatu antediluvian, absolutely despises all his spawn and seeks to exterminate them. And all of the modern Nosferatu, which comprise the majority of the Nosferatu, descend from his rogue child, Baba Yaga. Those of his childhood that remained loyal, aka the ones that were still bloodbound, to Absimiliad comprise a small but extremely dangerous bloodline of apex predators that is so unnourished by human blood that they need to hunt vampires. They are almost the opposite of regular Nosferatu in that they will never sleep underground. They will not do it. And they will tend to make their havens on the outskirts of civilization, where they build like little cults of ghouls and devotees around themselves. The clan bane also works differently for them in that they are, instead of being hideous, imbued with a sort of otherworldly beauty. And the focus here really is on the word otherworldly. They like have this, this pale white skin and these elongated features and the strange facial muscles and stuff. They look like aliens basically. They just don't look immediately hideous, is what I mean. Part of this probably has to do with the fact that they exclusively embrace incredibly beautiful youths. And over time, actually, this otherworldly beauty wears off and they look more and more like regular Nosferatu. And there is a theory that uh, uh, they can't, if they don't embrace someone who is like very young and very, very beautiful, they just come out as a regular Nosferatu. And those of those who manage to flee and not get immediately destroyed by their master sometimes reintegrate into Nosferatu society, which is why some Nosferatu, like, uh, phenotypes uh, have features that are ascribed to certain particular individual Niktuku, so there's a bit of a cross-pollination across the bloodlines. However, as a plus for the Niktuku, the uglier they become over time, the stronger they also become. Like, that's a directly inverse causal relationship. They have access to the disciplines all specs, which is supernatural senses, celerity, which is super speed, and potence, which is super strength. So, very different loadout from the regular Nosferatu that makes them extremely dangerous. Crucially, they all tend to be of rather low generation and also have access to other disciplines because they are notorious diabolists. They don't really care about the masquerade or all the politics of vampire society. They just want to kill Nosferatu. But there's also a lot of other vampires around and sometimes you're hungry and there's really not that much of a point to leaving the last swig in the juice box. Another great example of a bloodline that likes to see itself as the actual real clan is the old clan Samizzi, which, given that the moniker of the regular clan Samizzi is already the old clan, you can imagine how ancient these people are. Like, very few of them are younger than 500, and most are way older. They call themselves the Draculesti, and this really is because they are the epitome of like the Dracula living in a castle type vampire. But the main difference between them is they didn't adopt the, in their opinion, tainted discipline of vicissitude when they moved over to the Sabbat. Or rather, the, you know, the younger generation of Clan Sumitsi moved to the Sabbat they didn't. Like, they were the people that were rebelled against by those younger Tsumitsi. And instead of having vicissitude, they are masters of Koldunic sorcery, which gives them access to control over various spirits of the land. They are more sedentary even than regular Tsumitsi, but they write home field advantage in all caps, because they know immediately when you have stepped onto their domain, they can make the earth bind you, set you on fire, and then write a lightning to your position to watch you burn. It should be noted that there are Tsumitsi in like the younger clan that also are 
experts at Koldunic sorcery, it's just that none of them are really masters of it. Nevertheless, the old clan Samitsi's discipline spread is animalism, which is control over animals, all specs, which is supernatural senses, and dominate, which is mind control. Koldunic sorcery is maybe technically a discipline, but it is always purchased at out of discipline cost prices, which is a good thing because it is very, very powerful. This makes it different from, say, Tremere or Banu Hakim blood magic. Most of the old Sumitsu that remain exist in a political apparatus called the Oradea League, which is sort of like a Dracula EU. But the, the reason that it's them specifically, like most of them at this point, is that during the Anarch Revolt and the Sabat rebellion against them, those were the ones that were able to defend themselves best because they had these alliances to fall back on. Also, they're like completely localized to Transylvania. You will not find old clan Sumitsi outside of Transylvania. And though they do look down on the main body of the clan for their rebellion, they don't really hate them. In their minds, the Sabat Sumitsi are just... they were duped by the machinations of the elders. They are tools created to do its bidding. They're just one step above being like glorified ghouls, essentially. You wouldn't stay mad at a dog for biting you, especially if that's what you trained the dog to do. I've alluded, touched upon the Hikata bloodline of Samedi before. It is genuinely one of my favorites. Not only are they cool Caribbean sort of voodoo necromancers, but they also have this thing where they're really actual corpses and continue to rot and decay over time. Nobody knows where or even when they originated, though theories are of course numerous. Some suggest that they were created by a Cappadocian who somehow didn't go to the Feast of Folly and wasn't destroyed by Augustus Giovanni. And their bane is definitely very Cappadocian-like. The Cappadocians also looked like corpses, except like the Samedi are that times a lot more. They're like horrible, decaying corpses, as opposed to just looking like corpses. How little information there actually is about the origins of the clan is Rather ironic, given that Baron Samedi, no relation, as he will be the first to tell you, is actually still around and very accessible to members of his bloodline and to people outside his bloodline as well. Many suspect that the chaotic and inconsistent rumors that he contributes to with all manner of lies and different stories at every opportunity that he gets are actually a kind of subterfuge by him to hide the fact that well, you know, even though he is of a fairly low generation and rather powerful, the rest of the clan seems to be rather young. In the past, the Samedi have been tolerated as masquerade breaches by princes of many domains for various reasons. For one, they made sure to stick to their, like, isolated immigrant communities where there, a lot of people were superstitious and, like, the idea that there were, like, death priests that looked like corpses was just something that people were like, yeah. Of course that's the case. And two, because they tend to work as mercenaries very effectively and their particular mastery over necromancy can be pretty useful. The Samedi have access to the discipline's fortitude, which is supernatural toughness, obfuscate, which is the ability to become undetectable, and thanatosis, which is a special form of necromancy that focuses on, like, actually doing harm to others, playing around with the state of death, and, very interestingly, nullifying some vampiric abilities. Though, of course, now that they're members of Clan Akata, their spread is a little different, though they can choose to get obfuscate instead of all specs, the way that uh, Clan Hikata usually does, and also, you know, thanatosis has been replaced with oblivion, obviously. And I think that unlike the Nagaraja, the Sumedi actually were integrated somewhat well into Clan Akata. Like, yes, they don't look like corpses anymore, uh, but they can still look like corpses. Now they have the painful kiss, especially so when they feed, they kind of look like corpses more than other times. They can choose to look like corpses whenever they want to, and they have access to sort of special abilities that gives their particular necromancy a special voodoo flair. Something I'm very curious about, right, is that uh, Baron Samedi, I'm pretty sure he attended the family reunion and was thus also changed in the same way. He clearly seems to be like buddies with the Capuchin, um, like, how- th does he look like a normal guy now? Is he just a guy? I don't know this. 
I'm very curious to like find out. Anyway, that's the bloodlines, at least the ones that I think are very, very cool. I feel like they add a lot of flair to Vampire. I hope they find a good way to integrate them into Vampire 5. I feel like the structure of Clan Carter is meant to be a bit of a pilot project in that direction, but I must admit I am not particularly impressed. But at the end of the day, one of the nice things about Vampire is that it's not particularly difficult to hack the system, so... Go forth and play it however you please. Let me know about your favorite bloodlines in the comments, and thank you very much for watching this video. Like, comment, subscribe, share this to your relevant communities, but do not spam them. Consider supporting me on Patreon or Subscribestar, buying some of the beautiful merchandise or the short story collection that I also have. And in that spirit, uh, the, the, rev the revolution will put the means of production in the hands of the working class. And see you around, cunts.